One more time. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. team and musicians and all the time that's spent in planning worship and they do such a marvelous job um, helping us to go before the throne in worship and so I'm very proud of, of the efforts and also uh, I would be amiss if I didn't mention all of our, our tech crew um, without them you wouldn't be able to hear us and uh, so I appreciate them very much I'm going to ask you if you would turn in your copy of God's Word to Isaiah chapter 55 I'm going to speak to you today about the controls of the mission. Some 600 years before Christ's earthly ministry, the prophet Isaiah foretold about the coming Messiah. In today's portion of Isaiah's prophecy, we're going to find that God's Word is absolutely vital uh, to, the, to His plan being accomplished in the way that He would want it to be accomplished. Um, give you a little bit of history there before we read the passage for today the people of God were experiencing great difficulties due to the exile that had happened years before and God's people were desperate and waiting um, for the deliverance that had been foretold about many times uh, from this exile to a place where they were free again uh, there was no bondage there. It's uh, freedom from exile that they were looking forward to. And in this particular portion of Isaiah, who prophesied over a very long period of time, um, in this particular portion of Isaiah, he has been pointing toward the coming Messiah, the one that would be the deliverer, the redeemer, and that would break the bondage that God's people have known. And so with that in mind, many people have mistaken this passage of Scripture and that passage of Isaiah, uh, and some still to this day have it mistaken. Uh, they believed that the Messiah that was, that was foretold about was going to come and give that deliverance from the exile that they were currently in physically. But we know, looking back in history, that the deliverer was coming and did come and many people missed it, even those who were religious and could have quoted um, any of the law and prophets. They missed it due to the fact that they thought it was all about the physical exile uh, being demolished. And so many people missed the Messiah. So they're waiting for this, again, some 600 years before Christ came for his earthly ministry. The prophet Isaiah is, is speaking of his coming and what it was going to entail and mean. So in today's passage of Scripture, the prophet Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is explaining to us the necessity of God's Word in the mission that is going to take place. So if you would, let's stand to honor and reverence the reading of God's holy inspired Word. Again, we're in Isaiah chapter 55. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 12. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven... And returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. 
Father, in Jesus' name, we are grateful for your word, and we stand, uh, those who are able, and we stand in our hearts, Father, to respect your word because of how precious it is to us. I pray, Father, that you would forgive us of any way that we failed you, that we may hear you clearly. Remind us, Father, that the proclaiming of your word is worship as well. It's not just about music. But help us to not only be hearers, but doers of your word. And I pray that each person that's here and each person that is watching on the web would feel that personal encounter with you today, that our lives may be changed in whatever way that needs to happen. I pray that the lost would be saved, the saved would be revived, and we would once again have that fire burning inside of us for your word and the things of you. I pray today you'll add to this church family. I pray that, Father, again, everything be done for your honor and your glory. So cleanse me from any unrighteousness. Make me a fit vessel for your honor and your glory. I do pray and give me your anointing in this time. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so scared of, of this opening illustration because I'm scared I'm going to lose everybody in here. But there may be a person or two... Uh, uh, Al and Libby, I know that y'all probably going to know what I'm talking about, and uh, uh, maybe a couple, a couple of more of you. Brother Giles is going to know what I'm talking about. I used to have to drive an old Massey Ferguson tractor. Does anybody know what that is? Let me see your hand if you know what old Massey Ferguson Tom does. Yeah. Okay. They, obviously, they had different models and everything, but the one we had was a, a pretty large tractor, and... Uh, I would have to drive this thing as, as I got old enough to, to do different things, you know, would be responsible to do some bush hogging or, or things like that usually. And we would have to drive the tractor sometimes uh, a little over a mile away to get it where we needed to, to take it and everything. This particular Massey Ferguson was not a new one. It had quite a bit of wear and tear on it, and not everything on it worked just right. So it was kind of one of those things you had to make do with what you had. I don't remember the exact things, events leading up to this particular uh, event, but I had to drive this Massey Ferguson um, uh, that little bit over a mile stretch on public road to get it to, to our house. And we were doing something that was actually going to be a surprise kind of for, for my dad. Uh, my dad had had some physical issues, a lot of back issues at this time, and was still having to work uh, basically as a forester, and so we were going to do something to surprise him. And we got to Wild Hair. We, it was time for us to have a swimming pool out in the middle of the country. In order to do part of it and get the land to set right, we kind of needed the old Massey Ferguson. That was all we had, and that was what we were going to use. But uh, there, something was wrong with the steering, uh, and probably more user error than anything. Uh, and I, I do have to dis, dis, disclose this. I was just a little bit over 10. I was probably about 12 years old at this time, maybe 13. And um, the, the steering was really odd on it, and so it, it scared the life out of me, to be honest. But I finally got it home okay, and I was proud. And Mom had seen her baby boy drive that tractor all the way home and make it safely. And I was going to be the hero and step up and become a young man here. You know, I was so proud. And I got it home, and we had a little turnaround, and I was bringing that big Massey up, and of course, when I saw that people could see me, I, I, I kind of cranked the uh, speed up just a little bit to make sure I looked like I knew what I was doing, looked like a man. And my dad had, for that period of time, engaged in a hobby where he built uh, these very sophisticated bird house cabin things. And he proudly displayed one in the middle of that turnaround, and I was going, and again, wanted to make sure I looked sharp. I want, I've always wanted to impress my mom. Boys, you all are, uh, we all ought to impress our moms. That's a big thing. So I was going around, and I was going by this particular birdhouse. The problem was that I had not seen it. And had the, uh, had the, the bush hog and everything on the back of the tractor. And I looked up all of a sudden and saw the birdhouse there, and I was fine because I had totally missed it. Y'all thought I was just fixing to do something wrong, didn't you? I fooled every one of you. But the problem is the story doesn't end there because what I didn't think about was that if you move that steering wheel some, that bush hog will sometimes have a little bit of wiggle room to it. You know what I'm talking about? Have a little give to it. 
And I was so proud because I had missed that birdhouse in front of everybody. But what I had failed to realize was that bush hog could do just as much damage. Now, I'm not lying when I tell you this. Obviously, I knocked down the, the birdhouse that took hours and hours, and I don't know if my dad ever forgave me for it. But we have to move on. Scripture says so. When I did that, though, it was the neatest thing I've ever seen in my entire life besides someone getting saved. Because the birdhouse didn't just knock over. It literally exploded. We have wondered to this day how this happened because it's not scientifically possible. So I don't know what God was doing in giving this particular miraculous thing in front of us, but it was miraculous nonetheless because it went just like this. Glass is everywhere. Cabin wood is everywhere, the whole thing. What I did learn from that is that it's important to know how to work your controls in order to make sure that you're accomplishing whatever task it is, you have to have the controls set just right. And when I put that extra speed to it, it flung it out a little bit and the rest is history. And I hope and pray to God that um, my dad, as old as he's getting, will forget that soon and uh, we'll go on with life. The controls to your mission are vitally important if you're going to accomplish the mission and you are going to accomplish the mission the way that God has set forth for us to do. I am afraid in the modern pulpit and in the modern day, the church has been so much more, and I'm talking about church worldwide, I'm definitely not uh, saying Belmont, but all of us could fall into this. I think that there's been such a movement to look more like the world that we are forgetting about church. And I'm scared that we put less and less of a priority of the proclamation and the teaching of God's Word. And so we end up with a lot of people who think it's a good thing to belong to, to Christ, but they don't know what that means every day. And a lot of shallow teachings coming, and people just are not seeing the importance of the proclamation of God's Word anymore. But that is the controls to our mission. First thing I want to talk to you about. God's Word is the substance of our mission. There are many books being written, even now, and have been written for years, that will tell you, if you do this, you'll increase 20%, or if you do this, you'll get more tithes, or if you do that. I want to explain something to you. While I think it's awesome that people research and share their experiences and everything else, I cannot, in my heart, accept that as the inspired word when in truth God's already told us what we need to know it's all in God's word now I believe in learning from other people and I think that's great I'm not downplaying that but what I'm saying is when we pick that book up and read that so that we get the numbers or the reaction that we want and we turn loose of God's inspired word we have lost the controls with which we need to do the mission so God's Word is the substance of our mission. Keep your Bibles open and look with me. Go back to verse 10. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. The very substance and the very uh, fullness of the mission that we embark on, not just on Sundays, by the way, but every day of our lives, every day we have breath, we need to remember that the very substance of our mission is the very Word of God. And again, you can follow whatever strategy seems popular at the moment, and some have merit and some do not, but it will never be as impressive and have the results that would even come close in comparison to the results that the Word of God can have. So we see that the, the analogy of the rain coming down, you have to understand, it, it, they just didn't go to the local Walmart and pick up a can of, of black-eyed peas when they felt like it. You, we, they were uh, relying on the rains to come to them in order for that life to come. And you have to understand, too, that in this, that illustration is being used 
Because truthfully, rain can mean life or death. Let me explain it to you. If God blesses the farmer's crop and God blesses it and sends the rain, that crop can live as opposed to die. And in chain effect, if the crop makes good, the farmer and his family and, and whoever else is around, they eat good and they're well nourished and taken care of. But if you take away that rain, the plants die and there's a deficiency of the food that was necessary for the farmer and his family. So rain uh, to the farmer is life or death. And I would then likewise say that the Word of God, and this is textually clear here, the Word of God is the same thing. If there is a famine for the Word of God even coming from the pulpit or the modern Sunday school class, if there is that deficiency there, it will bring forth death and decay because to the Christian, the Word of God is our life source. We base everything we are or should base everything that we are and do off of the Word of God. And I know many people, and I've, been, I've, I've done the same thing before, we say, okay, I'm going to go to church, and I hope the pastor will wrap it up pretty quick because I'm, I've got stuff to do today, or there's a football game on, or got to beat the Methodist to the buffet, or whatever it is. Let me mention this to you. I don't, I don't do all this preparation and prayer by the way, I don't just get up there and open a Bible and this all comes. It takes a lot. I do not do this just so I have the stage for a little bit and we're all happy. I do this because you are my flock under the care of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I'm going to make sure that the flock is taken care of, the biggest priority that I can set is on the very word of God being proclaimed with accuracy to bring life to you. So don't despise the preaching and teaching of God's word. It's important to us. In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. Jesus put a priority on the proclamation of God's holy word. And I'm going to tell you like this. I'm, I try to simplify things. Y'all can go get so complex with all the strategies and everything else. As for me... I want to follow what Jesus says, and if he says, I must preach, that means it's a priority. That means that's his priority for the Belmont family and for those that are watching on the web to have the word proclaimed and preached in accuracy, Holy Spirit-filled, because it'll bring life to God's people. You should not desire less and less preaching. You should make that more and more important. And by the way, it's not about Josh. I need to decrease so that he can increase. This is about what God can do through. It's not, for, it's not for my glory. It's for God's glory. And I'm praying and hoping Sunday, day, day in, day out, and, and Sunday all the way to the next, praying for souls to be saved. And we're told in Romans 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you want your faith to go to that next level, if you desire to be in that next spiritual state, if you want to get Christianity right, or you want to be used of God, or you want to be able to minister in a profound way, the very first thing I would tell you is bow your knee and submit to God, and then you put the biggest priority that you possibly can every day of your life on the Word of God, for by that we will all be changed and we will all be saved. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot expect somebody just to get saved because you had the biggest festival in town or you had all the carnival rides or you gave out the most stuff. That's not going to save a soul. The salvation is going to come through the preaching and the proclamation of God's Word and God's Word being lived out. By the way, Never underestimate this. The greatest sermons that anybody will ever preach is their lives when they go, when they realize they're sent and they join forces as a church family and they go. That's the way it's going to be. And that's the greatest sermons that other people will ever see is your life. They will close their ears to somebody like me in a pulpit a lot of times, but they will sure look at you and say, how are you doing that? And you give the honor and the glory to Jesus Christ 
his name is exalted and lift, lifted up. And Jesus said this, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. You do not need a guru to come in and tell you what you need to do. You need to open God's word and see what God says you need to do. We overcomplicate things. Does anybody else feel that way? And again, how many churches, do you want to get in a competition in this area, in this Tampa area, or, or on the web, or whatever else? Do you really want to get in some competition over who has the best music, or who has the best looking people taking up the offering, or, or who um, can hold your attention along us, or who is dramatic, or who can hold your attention? Do you really want to get, because there's always somebody be that can do better than you. And I just believe that we miss the mark when we enter into the competition with others. I want to stand out. I believe we need to stand out. But I want the thing that stands out not to be Josh. I want the thing that stands out to be the Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit indwelling in the believers in the Belmont family to bind together in unity, whether you like some things or not, Bind together in unity and us make a difference in this community. This is our community. This is our time. This is where we're playing it. And the only true change that we will ever make in our community is by proclaiming and living the Word of God. It has to be the substance. It has to be the focus. Don't think you're going to come. All of y'all need to be here on Sunday night, by the way. We're going to have Sunday night service. I'm not about to get up there and do stand-up comedy tonight because that'll make you happy. You know what I'm going to do? God willing, I'm going to preach His Word. Because that's what we need. I need it. I listen to preaching. Y'all say, oh, a preacher goes and sits and listens. Yeah, I need to be fed too. I study for these sermons and dig for these sermons and apply these sermons before you ever hear one part of it uh, about it. Because I value the Word of God. It is the substance of our mission. The second thing I want to talk to you about is that God's Word is the strength of our mission. It's not only the substance of our mission, but it is the strength of our mission. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look in verse 11. It says, So shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Now I want to explain this because I believe there's some uh, inaccuracies about this particular text, so I want to set the, the ship in the right direction here so that you understand it. When you hear that word void, it means empty, or in vain and it says it shall not return to me void it is saying that when God's word is, is, is sent out it will not come back it will not return unto me void it will not return empty or in vain Bill Bright for Campus Crusade for Christ defined evangelism as sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Home missionary, I'd like to say this to you in earnest. You will never, ever, ever in your entire life go out and save anyone. You see, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's not your job to save people. God never called anybody in here, including the preacher, to go save anyone. There's good news about that, though. And sometimes we say, well, I, I wish I could save someone. I wish I could do that. And sometimes I do, too. Sometimes you're like, uh, can I get a, like a rubber mallet and pop them over the head so that to get what's going on there? You know, I kind of wish I could do that. But I think they put you in jail for that last time I checked, so I can't do that. I bet it would, it would make news on YouTube, though, if the pastor started going around and doing that. But I, I need to escape that kind of thing. The good news about it is that, obviously, we know we need to share Christ. 
the other good news of it is that we do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the good part about the very end of that definition of evangelism, which is one of the best that, that I've ever heard from, and it's from Bill Bright, is he said, and leaving the results to God. In other words, you're not responsible to save anybody. That's between them and God. Only God can save. Well, you know what I mean. I'm talking about going, no, I don't know what you mean. You need to get it right. Only God is able to save someone's soul. But what we do is bear witness or be that testimony as to his goodness. And if you begin to look at evangelism and missions from the standpoint of it's not our job to save anyone, it'll take a lot of the pressure off of you. Now, we are called to go. We're called to open our mouth. Mark 16, go and preach the gospel to every creature. But we have to remember, too, that we need to get it right in saying, I cannot save anyone, but God can. God, begin that process and use me to be a testimony unto you. The world doesn't need you to be a savior. The world already has that in Jesus Christ. The world needs people that will point others to Jesus because he is the Savior. The strength of the mission is that we have the word of God. Uh, Mark 13, 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. In other words, the word will always be. Do you think it's any accident that as John opened his gospel, in the beginning was the word. Jesus being the embodiment and fulfillment of the word. The last thing I want to talk to you about ties in to the thing that I just mentioned, and it's that God's word is the success of our mission. Look back in verse 11 and we're going to get into verse 12 just, just slightly. So shall, my word, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Remember that word void, empty or in vain. I don't have time to get into it a whole lot, and I sure wish I did. But you have to remember that when you proclaim God's word, it will never return empty and it'll, re never, it'll never return in vain. You may say, I witnessed and witnessed and witnessed and nobody ever accepted. That's not your job. You're supposed to witness. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The very success of the mission that we are trying to accomplish for the Lord Jesus Christ through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the success will be the Word. You can argue all day long what tendency people have to like this or what desire people have to hear that or think that or whatever the success of the mission long term will be the Word of God. The pastors who have longevity in churches and see success, you know what's the priority in their lives? The prayer and the study and proclamation of God's Word. When it says that it, will pro it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it, I want to talk to you about that word because it's pretty important. And then I'm going to bring it uh, to a close. When it says it shall prosper, in its root form, that Hebrew word literally means to push forward. It doesn't mean all the frills and everything's going to be there. What it says is it's going to push forward. When it says it shall prosper, talking about the word of God, it means it will push forward. 
So I'm going to tell you like this. Take a little bit of a load off of you. It is not on you to recreate any wheels that are out there or to be the publicity stunt that people are hoping for and wanting for. You know what's going to prosper? You know what's going to push forward through any of that mess? God's Word. Let me break it down for you. We, we would join and say that we want our mission to be a success for the Lord. Then if we're promised success in something, wouldn't we implement that into the church? Let me tell you what you implement into the church that will work every time. It'll never be done in vain and it'll never have empty results. You want me to tell you what that is? God's Word. It's got to be something else. No, it doesn't. It's about God's Word. Well, that's not going to pay my bills. If you live according to some of those things Proverbs says in there, you know what? Get your bills paid. Well, it's not going to make sure that I feel better about myself. You begin to listen to God's Word, and you know what will happen? God will deliver you from that, that uh, miry clay, as the song said, and will set your feet upon solid rock. Well, spiritually, I'm scared to death of this and that and all that. You know what will drive away fear 100% of the time successfully? Not the next episode of Dr. Phil or whoever else. God's Word will work 100% of the time. Jeremiah, it was said to him, and it's recorded for us, you will search for me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Well, I tried reading my Bible and it didn't do anything. Did you really try searching or did you just kind of browse through and see if there was anything there for you? The success of the church will be the Word of God. Nothing else. Do we need to pray about strategies? Yes. Do we need to be on mission? Yes. Do we need to be concerned about the lost souls and how to reach them? Yes. I'm not discounting any of that. But what I'm saying is, when you put more of your focus and intentions and attention on those things as a priority before God's Word, I believe we're in sin. The success will be God's Word. And it will never return empty, or in vain, useless. Because it's going to do what God wants it to do. It takes a little bit of the pressure off evangelism and missions when you think about the things like that. And Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I mean to tell you this, I, I'm privileged and love being an American. I, I really do. I, I think that is an awesome privilege that we're all given. And by the way, we should always be trying to lift up our nation, not tear it down. You need to join me in that effort. Again, you're not always going to agree with everything or you're not always going to like everything. But we need to remember that we need to be praying for those in authority over us, not tearing down. And we need to be doing what we can to make a difference and add salt and light in a very dark world. So I'm very privileged to be an American. Now I'm going to tell you something that some of you will probably take offense to, but I mean no offense. I, again, I value our nation. I think we ought to stand together and unite, especially those of the, of the church, you know. There'll be a day where the United States of America, that flag that we adore so very much. Many people bled and died so that we'd have the freedom to be here today, and I thank God for all of them. Many people keep us safe, first responders, day in, day out. I thank God for them. But let me mention to you as an aside, there will be a time when we get in, this gets into foretelling future. There will be a time where this flag will no longer be necessary. And there will be a time where we do not have to rely on the police to come rescue us. By the way, Brother Jason, we appreciate you for what you do and any others. 
But there'll be a time where you're not going to have to pick up the phone and call the police to come settle a dispute or handle something or rush somebody to the hospital. You see, what's going to happen is all the former things will have passed away. And behold, as Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. And so as much as we adore this nation and love it and should pray for our leaders and be salt in light and light in a dark world, you have to remember that those things will one day pass away. But I'm here to tell you, if you want to know what will stick and what will last and what will be alive forever and ever and ever, throughout all of future and throughout all of eternity, look no further than the Bible that you hold in your hands because we're told over and over again that the Word of God will stand forever. Why would we not put a bigger emphasis on the proclamation of God's Word? I'm not asking you to do anything that's outside of what you can do. I'm asking you to join with me in the effort. And let's make God's Word the priority. Not just around here, but in our lives every day. We're going to have a time of decision, and here's what it's for. If there's, if there's anyone in here who has never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and taken Him at His Word, that He and He alone can forgive sins and grant eternal life, Today, would you trust his word and step out in that faith and submit yourselves to the Lord for his use? Also, if you are not currently um, active in a, a good church home or maybe God's leading you to join on mission alongside of us so that we can win this community, win our community together because, again, we need all the help that we can get. And by the way, nobody's looking to judge you or put you down. We're looking to lift you up and to, for you to join with us shoulder to shoulder for the mission that God has for us. So if you need to join a good church home, we'd love to have you. If you find yourselves in need of asking God to either forgive you for not spending the time in His Word or either you need to make a commitment to the Lord uh, to be in his word. I believe in those things. Would you come to the altar? Would you pray and ask God to help you with those things? Or if you need someone to pray with you, I'll be here. I want to ask our um, praise team to come on down. This is a very sacred moment, very serious moment, very, very special moment. Where people can respond, not just because somebody heard the preacher and saw his green shirt, but it's for people to be able to respond because they've heard God's voice. And if God's saying to you, drop what you're doing and make that decision today, I'm just going to ask you, if you would, to come. This church family will by no means cast you out. We will celebrate in what God is doing in your life. I just ask you now, if God's calling, would you come? Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you'll bless this time and father that everything be done decently and in order and for your glory and i pray that as your word's been proclaimed father that that is exactly what will go straight and push forward into our hearts pray for those that are wanting to step out in faith and make that decision today oh god pray that you'll give them the courage and help us as a church family to support that and I pray in all things, O oh God, that you would bless the mission and help us to put a priority on your word. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jason.